So, uh, hi, Paul. Uh, I'm, um, we're very glad to invite you here today to accept our interview um, here today at Doha. And uh, um, and here we are like facing very difficult uh, negotiation, and but like we uh, see, um, I'm at least myself very surprised that like uh, Scottish government actually taking very progressive climate actions um, back at home. Um, so um, maybe you can first introduce yourself and uh, talk a bit about like um, the Scottish government's action back at home. Absolutely. Well, I'm Paul Wheelhouse. I'm the Minister for Environment and Climate Change in the Scottish Government, and we are here as part of the UK delegation, but we're. Uh, aiming to try and promote what Scotland is doing in terms of our action on creating a low carbon economy to try and demonstrate to countries which are considering which path to take in terms of their um, climate action that taking uh, a low carbon growth model which we are trying to pursue in Scotland um, is uh, not only good for the environment but actually good for your economy and for the prosperity of your people. Uh, it's been a counter, counter cyclical uh, development for Scotland in that we've had, generally speaking, as much of the developed world has had an economic downturn in the last three or four years. Uh, but the one area of the economy that's really uh, growing rapidly is our development of renewable energy and our investment in low-carbon jobs. But we're also here because we want to try and push other countries to a higher level of ambition. Uh, Scotland has a 42% target for climate change uh, reduction, uh, greenhouse gas reduction um, from the 1990 baseline and we are currently sitting at 22.8% uh, against uh, the 42% target. So we're more than halfway towards achieving that 2020 target and we have a target for 80% reduction by 2050. So clearly we're here to learn as well as, as to tell people what we're doing to learn from others as to uh, efforts they are taking and maybe lessons we can apply in Scotland as well. But the third thing we're here to demonstrate is really what we're doing in climate justice because uh, we feel that's an extremely important part to bridge the gap between developed nations and developing nations uh, to assist in uh, bringing new technology to developing nations but also in our case we fund a number of uh, projects which are in uh, Malawi and Zambia which are aimed at improving the water infrastructure and supply of fresh drinking water for people in those countries. Yeah, so I, I quote from you um, uh, yesterday that you said that Scotland uh, places the climate justice as the very uh, heart of the uh, decisions you make on um, um, energy policy and economic and social development policies. So um, why does um, the Scottish government um, it, taking this climate leadership, uh, why you guys are uh, really caring about these things and uh, um, personally what's your de definition of climate justice? We'll start with the, the definition. The definition is really one based on human rights and it's linking environmental impact and human rights. And it's a, it's a message that says to all countries across the world that everyone has a fundamental right to clean water and to food and to a fundamental right to life. So we're sending this concept into the environmental sphere and in our terms it's about helping developing nations to adapt to climate change and help them also to um, promote efforts locally uh, in their countries to address mitigation. So in terms of what we're doing on that front, um, we are uh, we're funding, as I say, a number of projects in, in Malawi and Zambia on the hydro theme, sort of hydro nation theme, to improve water infrastructure. And that's also got a gender, uh, gender benefits as well, because there's many women in, 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 in Malawi are involved with trying to source water for the family. And so by providing an easily accessible uh, water supply, then it helps them in terms of their, their social development, educational access and other issues as well. So it's, uh, but why we're doing it in Scotland is because it's not, um, uh, it's not something that necessarily benefits the people of Scotland, but it's a moral issue. We are a developed country uh, the developing nations have had uh, having to take the, the brunt of, of the climate change in terms of the impact on their environment, but they've had very little impact at all in creating the emissions that started this position. So we feel as a developed nation we have a responsibility to do what we can to help those countries that are affected by um, man-made climate change uh, to, to address the impacts. Um, I guess like um, climate justice is like kind of very difficult question for everyone. Uh, and here we have uh, facing um, the climate urgency seriously. Um, but why we have to um, try to tackle this very difficult question right now here at UNFCCC? Well, because um, we, we feel very strongly, uh, as do many other countries, that uh, we have to have a higher rate of ambition between now and 2020. This is a critical period for the, the effects of climate change to take impact. And, and if we can't um, show ambition now between now and 2020, it's going to be far more difficult beyond 2020 to maintain the global temperature rise to, to 2 degrees Celsius. So the longer we leave it, 
the more difficult it will become, more expensive it will become for countries to adapt to climate change. So we think it's very important we take action now while we can. And within, we're fortunate in a country like Scotland to have a wealth of natural resources that enables us to, to exploit renewable energy opportunities. Um, but also we've got the expertise and knowledge that can help other countries to do similar, similar work. So uh, what's your take on historical responsibilities and uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities? Well, I think uh, all developed nations, um, we've benefited from a high carbon industrialization process in Scotland and other European nations and also developed countries outside of Europe. So we feel that um, we, what we want to do is help developing nations to develop their economy but skip that high carbon phase of their economic development and move straight to a low carbon growth model. So, so we can export technology um, and, and work with countries to develop their own uh, capacity in renewable energy and things like CC, carbon capture and storage um, uh, technologies as well, that then what that will do is allow countries to perhaps use fossil fuels but in a more sustainable way, but also allow them to develop renewable energy and help them move on to a, a, high, you know, a higher uh, uh, ability to grow their economy but also in a way that's less damaging for the environment. So we want them to learn from the mistakes we've made because um, we have to recognise we did make mistakes. We didn't have access to the technology we have now, but now that we have that, we can help other countries to skip that dirty phase of their, their industrialization. Thank you. Um, more regarding to the um, Doha negotiation here, um, what's your suggestion for countries to move forward in the next uh, three years, I mean, regarding to uh, the climate equity issue? Well, we, we feel it's very important that we do get a, a commitment to the second period of the Kyoto Protocol. I think that's absolutely essential. We feel that we need to carry forward the momentum that was developed in Durban in terms of uh, measures and adaptation and, and other areas. Uh, but we feel it's essential that countries have high ambition. And those countries, I think uh, uh, the, the EU delegation, which we are supporting, has made clear that we've, we feel where countries have targets, they need to demonstrate that they're going to meet those targets. We are doing our, our own part in Scotland to try and ensure that people are aware of what we are doing to demonstrate uh, commitment and meeting our targets. But other countries that don't have targets need to adopt targets and start to set a level of ambition that's consistent with keeping temperatures at 2 degrees Celsius. So it's vital that we have that consensus about what needs to be done and countries stepping up to the plate to, to put something on the table that says this is how we're going to achieve it. Um, yesterday, the uh, U.S. Special Envoy Thorsten said that like, the U.S. would like to have um, some discussion on climate equity and the uh, CBDRRC principle. What's your take on that? Well, I certainly welcome any commitments that countries, particularly developed countries, are making to the developing nations because we need to build uh, a trust uh, with developing nations that they are being asked to make major sacrifices themselves and are clearly the many countries are suffering the biggest impacts of current impacts of climate change. And so I think it's important that developing nations like the US, and I very much welcome any commitment they have made to equity and to uh, adaptation measures to enable countries to uh, address the challenges they face and certainly would support that. And we're doing our bit in Scotland through efforts through climate justice and through our international development funding. But we, we, we're very grateful if other countries are following suit. So. so you are going to, I mean, the Scottish government is going to hold our um, climate justice conference next year? Indeed, we are working with Mary Robinson Foundation, Mary Robinson herself uh, and um, Ed Cameron at the World Resources Institute to develop a conference next year in Scotland which will uh, highlight the, uh, the issues about cl surrounding climate justice and the link to the right to life, water, food um, and, and Mary Robinson is particularly passionate about ensuring that countries have access to food to address hunger but also to build in, uh, we hope the theme of the conference will to be bring the business community into the tent and try and get them to uh, engage in supporting efforts on climate justice and equity issues. Um, thank you. So the, maybe my last question is that right now we are facing very um, challenging situation uh, as the um, la uh, second last day. So uh, some people like uh, have some criticism up toward the um, Qatar um, presidency. What's your suggestion for uh, them to be more constructive in this process? I think, well, to put on record, I think we've been finding it a very welcome uh, experience in Qatar and uh, we've certainly been engaged by the people of Qatar while we've been here. I think the, the onus really is on the countries, the member states and the, and the blocs to, to come forward with concrete positive proposals. Um, the presidency can only do so much. It's, it's for the, the partners in the conference to come together and realise um, that, you know, that look beyond the process and come forward with concrete commitments uh, because 
frankly we're running out of time as, as you I'm sure well know um, the pressure is on in terms of keeping temperatures down to a reasonable level. Two degrees Celsius increase at a global level might be a four degree Celsius increase in Africa or beyond so these are really life, uh, life making decisions uh, that we're making here this week and I hope that people recognise that and come forward with concrete supportive proposals and be constructive and, and, and raise our, their ambition in terms of tackling climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.